sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Hey, Power Factor fans, another little segment. This time we're going to talk about, uh, we're, we're going to, we're still, there's going to be an ongoing series of episodes that deal with the new IDPA rules. One of the new rules is that uh, the backup gun or bug division is now uh, a full-fledged division, not just for side stages or bug-only matches. In fact, Tier 1 matches, which would be your typical monthly club match that you would attend, bug is required to be recognized. And to that end, uh, it's been made a six-shot division rather than a five-shot division. You can reload. You can carry um, three. If you're using six-round mags, since it's a six-round division, auto pistols will load five plus one with six-round uh, reloads on the belt. So you can carry three, I believe, three reloads. Um, and because it can be recognized now at sanctioned matches. Previously, it could not be. It was not allowed at sanctioned matches, but now it's optional. So we're doing our planning for the 2015 uh, Washington State Championship, and we're trying to decide, do we want to recognize Bug this year for the first time or not? And one of the issues is that if you accept Bug as one of your competitive divisions, you must calibrate your steel for the 380 cartridge. Now the 380 cartridge is not a real barn burner. Um, currently your uh, steel has to be calibrated for stock service revolver, currently meaning today, uh, uh, February 28th, uh, 2015. It has to be calibrated for stock service revolver, which is 105 power factor. Well, the new rule book that's come out that takes effect tomorrow the power factor for 380 is 95 power factor, which is pretty low. And if you've shot many matches, you know that a pepper popper is a pretty good sale. You get it set up there. If you have a breeze blowing through your bay, it's possible that the wind can blow the poppers over. You can also have an issue of if the ground isn't especially solid, every time that popper falls, it starts pounding the back of the uh, popper frame into the ground and can change the calibration. And the closer that, uh, the, 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 essentially the lower the power factor, the smaller that window is between a popper that will stay up in a breeze and a popper that uh, when it falls will pound a dent, a dent into the ground to the extent that you'll lose that uh, fine adjustment. So one of the things that I volunteered to do uh, I've been a uh, match director in the past for the match. Last year I was kind of match director emeritus, acting as a kind of a advisor, sometimes valued, sometimes ignored, uh, for the match director. And this year I've uh, taken on the responsibility of range master. And, and the range master position, while not um, uh, kind of specified in the rules, it's a position that we've had at our club for many years. It's just kind of like an extra set of eyes looking for safety issues um, during match setup and whatnot. But the range master is the person who is tasked with uh, calibrating steel at the Washington State Championship match, and so that falls to me. So I asked the match director, hey, are we going to recognize Bug this year? And he said, eh, well, I don't know. And then some of the discussion revolved around, is it practical? And there's two issues. One, can we get the steel set so that it will stay standing and not become uncalibrated uh, quickly or easily to the extent that we'll have to be constantly recalibrating it? The other issue is the minimum power factor, as I speak today, uh, for, th for the 380 calibration is 95 power factor. Now, if you look at the published ballistics for 380, there are very, very few uh, commercially available 380 rounds that will make 95 power factor. Uh, the round that I happen to have a small supply of is the Hornady, I think they call it uh, critical defense or something like that. It's a 90 grain bullet at 1,000 feet per second, which doesn't make it. Most hardball, uh, your factory hardball rounds are 95 grains, but they're only going 900 to 950 feet per second. And a lot of those rounds, the factory specs are based on a four inch barrel, but a lot of the guns you're actually gonna see in competition are three inch barrels. So it's, uh, we may see a revision in that power factor. But I decided I better go to the range and first see if I can hit anything. 
uh, calibrating the steel, of course, requires hitting the 8-inch calibration zone on a pepper popper at 10 yards because, of course, or perhaps even uh, at a longer distance. If you have a popper that's set where the only place you can engage it from is 12 or 15 yards away, then you're going to have to calibrate it at 15 yards. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure I can hit the popper at consistently at 15 yards with a 380. And I have a couple to choose from, but one of them had a little issue. Now, this is a gun that's been on the show before. I don't remember when. I might have talked about it during uh, the bug episode. It's a Colt, uh, popularly today called the model of 1908. Um, the pistol was, to, was originally uh, released in 1903 in 32 caliber, and then in 1908, 380 was added. And it was one of the massive selling handguns of the interwar period um, between the end of World War I and the start of World War II. Uh, it was an extremely popular gun, sold in large numbers, and it's got a, a, a kind of medium length three and three quarter inch barrel. So I thought, okay, that's pretty suitable. I mean, it's not an ultra long barrel and it's not an ultra short one, so uh, let's fire a few rounds through it. And this is a gun that belonged to my dad, and I've had it in my gun safe since 1987. But prior to about two or three years ago, I'd never shot it. Um, I would take it out of the safe every year, wipe it down, do a little fee, uh, detail or field strip anyway, wipe everything down, put it back together, and put it back in the safe for another year. And I decided that we were doing a bug side stage, and I had a box of 380 ammo. I said, okay, I'll, let's, you know, I'll shoot the stage with it. Uh, it might be kind of fun. And what I found was that even at five yards, bullets were hitting the target sideways. They were keyholing uh, terribly. And, of course, that has no uh, beneficial effect on the accuracy either. And although I'd never really looked very closely, I'm going to see if we can see it here. Let me see where it is. The muzzle at some point was damaged right there. It was dropped on something or something hit it. And the problem was that that impact is near enough to the, uh, the origin of the rifling that metal was actually displaced into the bore. So every time a bullet was passing out of the barrel, the last thing it hit was this flat spot on this one side where this dent was, and that's what was causing the bullets to tumble and keyhole. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to hit anything at 10 or 15 yards with this. So I took it over to JPL. Uh, that's John Larson, our, our uh, host here on uh, Power Factor. And I uh, took it over to his place, and he took a look at it. And the, the way the barrel is designed, normally uh, to... Um, recrown a barrel you'd want to put it in the lathe get it spinning and uh, just cut out that part that's blocking the bore but this bore is not cylindrical or or concentric to the bore at either end the uh, the chamber is enlarged and kind of asymmetrical and then there's a locking lug here right near the end of the barrel um, so there's really no way to chuck it up in the lathe so john used a very uh shall we say novel approach to cutting out the part of the uh, crown that was damaged and essentially create a clean crown um, so that as the bullet's leaving, it's not meeting any obstructions. It's not, uh, you don't want gas to be venting out on one side before another side as the bullet leaves because that can push it off course. You just want a nice symmetrical clean crown. So I took it to the range, uh, set up uh, IDPA target out at 10, uh, 10 yards and put uh, 10 rounds on it at 10 yards. Got a group about this big. Um, the holes are nice and round, no evidence of uh, keyholing. So it looks like we've got at least our chrono gun. I didn't have a chance to chrono uh, the rounds that I did fire, but I just thought you know, it would be kind of academic if I couldn't hit the target at 10 yards. So at least I'm confident now that if I do my part, I can put rounds on the calibration zone of a popper at 10 or 15 yards. Now I need to go down the path of trying to find a factory load that will make consistently make power factor. And what I'd really like to do is announce the load that I'm going to use so that if people come to the match, they at least have some idea if I use that load, I ought to be able to make it. But that's uh, that'll be a future story. But just an example of um, issues that you can have. If your gun is, the accuracy is lousy, take a look at the muzzle. Um, I had an old, uh, actually uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I had a Smith & Wesson Model 29 44 Magnum revolver, and it was the same issue on the cylinder. It looked like somebody had whacked the, the face of the cylinder with a ball-peen hammer. There were these little semi-circular dings, 
And on two of the chambers, they intruded into the chamber mouth to the extent that every time you fired the gun, that bullet was going to hit that flat spot on its way out, and that certainly can't do anything for accuracy. So check your muzzle crown um, or on a revolver, the face of the cylinder, look for little distortions that can affect, adversely affect accuracy. made a huge difference. I mean, on this gun, it was just really just that little bit of material there that was intruding into the bore um, made a huge difference. So... Uh, we'll cover it again in the future, see if we can find that round, see if we, and, and if you're going to shoot the match and you want to shoot your bug, you'll probably find out first here uh, whether we'll be uh, chronoing, uh, calibrating that is to either the bug standard or the uh, revolver standard. Hey, Perfect fans, I'm Rick. And uh, we've had a couple of product announcements, not really product tests. Uh, that well, the tests will come later, but I didn't really want to wait necessarily wait for testing before I you know spill the beans. So this is a product announcement, uh, a new product on the market. It's it's it, we'll do a little history. So uh, traditionally, you've in a competition shot with specifically 1911 style pistols. You've had bullseye competition, and then we've had the action pistol sports, uh, practical pistol, uh, steel challenge, that kind of stuff. And within the bullseye realm, you have hardball, which is like the national uh, matches where you're using a, a GI spec pistol shooting full power ammo. And then you have softball loads, bullseye shooting, where you're shooting reduced power ammo, uh, wad cutters at low velocity and uh, different re mechanical requirements to accommodate the different power levels because there are certain constants. The gun, for instance, the weight of the reciprocating components, the weight of the barrel, you can change those with a bull barrel versus a bushing barrel. You can drill holes in the slide, but certain kinds of competition, you can't do that. You're stuck with the, the fixed weight. And so you'll, depending on the power level, you might want to try to alter things like spring rates, for instance. Uh, we've discussed in prior episodes about loading for high velocities and high pressure ways to retard slide movement using um, small radius on the firing pin stop, using heavier main springs, heavier recoil springs to retard the movement of the slide when shooting high, high velocity full power ammo. But what if you're at the slower end? What if you're shooting, say, a full-size 5-inch 1911 with minor power 9mm ammo? I know some people that advocate loading up to, say, 140 power factor because the big, heavy slide, uh, the gun can be really sluggish um, with, that, with the, the, all the, only the amount of power available in the 9mm cartridge loaded down to power, minor power factor. Then there's also the matter of... Uh, uh, 22 conversion units or rim fire 1911s. Steve and I did an episode a couple of years ago, um, and you've got the same issue. My conversion unit is an old Colt. It's got a full profile steel slide on it, and depending on how you juggle your springs, 22 ammo can be somewhat marginal in terms of the amount of recoil energy available to cycle the slide. Oh, excuse me, I'm still getting over a cold. So what is what is it you can do to essentially increase the leverage that the hammer has, or the slide has relative to the hammer for these situations where you're shooting weak ammo, exactly the opposite of what we were pursuing before in our, in our 45 Super episode of trying to resist uh, the slide movement. And what you can do is essentially the opposite. So here's an illustration. I've been big on illustrations lately. Here's our standard 1911. Here's our hammer and our firing pin stop. And you can see this rather generous bevel here on the bottom of the firing pin stop that results in the hammer contacting the face of the firing pin stop right here. Now, if you imagine that this is a lever and the hammer pin or over around which the hammer uh, pivots is down here, Here's the length of our lever. Now, what we did with our 45 Super was put a firing pin stop on it that looked like this, with a much smaller radius on the heel of the firing pin stop, which lowers the contact point between the face of the hammer 
and the firing pin stop down here. So now look how much shorter that lever is. We've cut it probably 25% or more off the length of this lever, decreasing the leverage that the slide has in cocking the hammer. And if you put the square or reduced radius firing pin stop on there and increase the rating of the mainspring, you really can retard this movement. Uh, and of course, it makes it hard to cock, uh, rack the slide because you're overcoming this short lever. And the way I, I've illustrated it in the past is just go to any door with a hinge on it and push the door open by pushing on the uh, doorknob and the door will just swing right open. It doesn't take much effort. You don't have to apply the effort for very long. Just give it a little push and it comes right open. Well now, close the door, not latch it, but close it. Now put your finger near the hinge and try to push it open. You have to push a lot harder and a lot longer to get that door moving. And that's exactly the effect that you're getting here. You're moving the, the imagine this is the tip of your finger trying to push the door open right near the hinge. Um, and, and that's where you get your uh, increase uh, in the resistance to the movement of the slide. Well now what can you do to re reduce the resistance of the slide? Look at the way the face of the hammer has been relieved so that now the contact point is right up here just below the firing pin. So you're getting exactly the opposite effect. You're lengthening the lever from the pivot point down here all the way up to here. And so if you've got, say, you're trying to get your softball 45 wad cutter loads to cycle reliably and you've already reduced your springs, let's say, like if you'll remember the episode we had, I mean, going way back to the original episodes we had on the show, Steve's Edge, uh, his uh, STI Edge 40 Smith & Wesson absolutely won't run with Russian primers because STI supplies a 15 pound mainspring. There's just not enough energy um, to crack that primer. But what if you, for instance, increased your spring from 15 pounds to 19 pounds or 23 pounds and then installed this hammer in it. So now you've got essentially equal uh, resistance to the movement of the slide. If you're used to a certain uh, cycling rate or a certain feel to the gun, you can possibly uh, retain that same feel but increase your ignition reliability by not having to resort to lighter springs. You can use a full power spring, but by reducing or increasing that the, the leverage has over the, uh, that the slide has over the hammer, you can tune your loads, tune your springs, get your uh, rim fire conversion to run more consistently. I remember I saw one rim fire conversion that actually comes with an extra main spring. And in order to do the conversion, it's not just a matter of replacing the barrel and the slide. You have to put the new ma either mainspring or mainspring housing on the gun because it's not enough energy to cycle the slide um, <clears throat> with a full power mainspring in it. So this is something that you could probably do to counter that. Run this hammer with the full power spring in your rimfire pistol or in any gun where you're trying to kind of rebalance the springs versus the reciprocating weight. So where are we going with all this? Well, there, for years, maybe 40 years, this idea has been around. Um, it's been in use. In fact, I'll show you a little secret. This is the hammer that I put on my 22 rimfire conversion when I, when I put the gun together. I bought a frame kit. And when I put it together um, over 20 years ago now, that's what I did to the hammer. I essentially relieved the face of it like that to increase the leverage so that the slide could more easily cock the hammer. And again, it's been used for years, but it always required that you manually, personally modify a standard hammer. So what's the news? A new product pre-modified the Cammer Hammer. Or as they say in New York, the Cammer Hammer. So there it is, Cammer Hammer. You see the illustration of it there with a dished out face. And what did I do with it? Oh, I put it in my 22 conversion. So here's my old Colt 22. And uh, you'll see that the thumb safety is missing. The grip safety has been uh, greatly reduced uh, because anytime you change the relationship of the hammer and the sear, you can 
change the relationship of the safety to the sear. The, the thumb safety on a 1911 acts on the sear. And so I haven't even tried to put the safety back in. This was just kind of like a little test go. But you can see the face of the hammer is relieved here. And that increases this leverage effect. Now, the problem that I've had is because it's a, a commander style hammer, it needs a beaver tail safety or a safety that's relieved down here to allow the hammer to sink down a little further. Uh, so I'm going to have to fiddle with the grip safety before I actually test fire it. But I expect it's going to work exactly like the hammer that was in there, providing exactly the same benefits in this application that even with a full power mainspring, the uh, 22, the weak power available in recoil from the 22 cartridge will be plenty to uh, reliably run the gun. And if you're, again, you're trying to make minor with a full size 1911, nine millimeter, you need a little extra oomph uh, to get that gun cycling. Uh, the initial unlocking, some people might try to use a, you know, a variable rate spring or something, but here's just another little trick in your uh, bag of tricks. Uh, if you think uh, it will work, and again, I, like the, the, I think this is the application obviously that works for me. Most of what I'm trying to do with most of my guns is retard the slide movement, and it's just the opposite of that. But if you've got a gun where you're trying to uh, kind of, again, give the, the slide a little boost in its ability to unlock the gun, check out the camera hammer. Um, it looks like a very high quality piece. It was easy to install. Um, the trigger pull, I mean, no 1911 part is guaranteed to be drop in. There's just too many dimensional variations and tolerances. But this part, all I did was uh, just run an India stone across the sides. I'd had to uh, peen the uh, hammer strut pin in place. The pin, I won't go into, I didn't have a hammer strut pin, I made one, it was, anyway. So I had to peen that and to make sure the peened areas, uh, burrs weren't uh, causing any issues. After I installed the spur, or after I installed the strut, I did run an India stone across the side to make sure that there weren't any burrs sticking up that were gonna catch on the edges of the frame. So that, I, I don't consider that a modification to the part, but I did peen the um, edges of the strut pin hole uh, to make sure that that pin didn't migrate at all inside the gun. But other than that, it was absolute drop in. Um, trigger pull, as you, you can hear it, I'm sure you can hear how nice it is. Oh yeah, let's try it one more time. Oh yeah, very nice. I mean, it turned out the trigger is very nice. It's probably about four pounds. I'm sure I could have fiddled around with it some more, but I, I, I don't know if I'm gonna leave the hammer in here. Uh, I don't know. We, we will do some test firing. But anyway, check it out, Camer Hammer. Um, it's a good looking part, fits. I mean, you can get it, I think, in stainless or uh, the oxide finish, but uh, check it out.